Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. We are in our study of the Corinthian letters, entitled, The Kingdom Building Project, Lesson 12. Hello and welcome back to our midweek study, uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 3. And if you would look with me there down at verse 6, we're going to be making our way down from verse 6 all the way down to verse uh, 15. And uh, looking at what God has to say to us through this very important, very crucial letter uh, in the New Testament. So let's ask God's help for all these things. Uh, Let's go to him in prayer. God, we are asking for help. We need help in every aspect of our lives. But as we come to uh, your word, which is just like a mirror where we can see ourselves, I pray you would help us to see what's really going on. It's so easy to look at others and um, see what's wrong with them. It's so hard to see what's wrong with us so many times. And and uh, that's why we have to come to this mirror so we can see our reflection the way it ought to be and the way you see it. And Lord, we thank you for your kindness and grace to us and how gently you reveal to us your truths. You know, just come and pour them all out on us. Uh, you give them to us bit, bit by bit so that we can accumulate. Lord, we're not here just to gain knowledge. We're not here just to learn stuff. We're here to be obedient. And uh, you're calling us to obedience, Lord. And it's only in obedience that we're going to be able to learn anything else. Because why would you give us one more thing when we haven't done the last thing you told us to do? So God, we're just asking your blessings over our time together and uh, your continued blessings over our study here in 1 Corinthians. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to be down in verses. Actually, let's start with verse 5. Paul is dealing with, of course, still the division in the church. He started there in the first chapter, and uh, they're dividing themselves. One says it's of Apollos, one's of Paul, one's of Cephas, one's of Jesus. They just keep naming these names, throwing out names, dropping names. And he says, well, we saw in the previous chapter, it's because you're immature, or the first part of chapter 3, it's because you're, you know, even though you're spiritual men, you're still acting like fleshly men, uh, still, still, still acting like you're, you're not grown up, you're immature. And because you're immature, you can't take this heavyweight stuff. And he's demonstrating it by the fact that you're jealous, the fact that you're divided, the fact that you're the way you're treating each other. And uh, he, he begins to uh, go from now transitioning from this whole issue of divisions and why they're divided. He's going to c- conclude it here in our study this, this, this time. And he's going to show us also how important the jobs of different workers are. He says, so you're, you're naming these names. He says, and they're not that there aren't putting names, but you need to know where they really fit in the scheme of things. And in fact, you need to know where you fit in the scheme of things. In fact, you're, you're fellow workers with us. So let's take a look here, verse 5. He says, what then is Apollos? Apollos was a great guy, first of all, by the way. He tells us in the book of Acts, he was a man mighty in the word. Knew the scriptures, great preacher, went there as a pastor, leader, elder for quite a while. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Paul's the one that started the church, remember? Servants. That's what they are. Through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So they're just servants. They're not masters. Why would you name yourself after any of them? So I planted, Apollos watered, verse 6, but God calls the growth. It's God that gave the increase. He's, you're giving us credit for stuff that we didn't do. Since I was baptized by Paul, I was saved under Paul's ministry. I was like, what good is that? Who cares? These are just servants. They're just there administering. One's planting the seed and one's watering. But I'm telling you, if God doesn't give the increase to that seed, doesn't matter what kind of seed it is, doesn't matter what kind of water you put on it, if God doesn't cause the growth, he says all the glory goes to God. Why are you dividing yourself? There's only one God and there's only one salvation and all of you have been partakers in this. Give glory to God. There's a unity in here. God saved me. God saved you. God saved all of us. Why are you even bringing up Paul and Apollos? They're servants. By the way, the implication is just like the rest of you are servants. And what was true for the Corinthian church is true everywhere. The kingdom of God is, is if, if you will, in this metaphor he's using here, it's like a farming project. We're all the plants. I'm a plant that's growing for the kingdom of God, hopefully producing fruit for the kingdom of God. Hopefully, hopefully that's what you are as well. We're all, we're all plants. The seed of the truth has been planted in us. Now we begin to grow. Now we begin to produce fruit. And so all of us are plants within that project. We're also, also, we're also workers 
as Paul and Apollos were, in the field of God. So we're all plants and we're all workers and, and it's all together uh, in, one, in one big field, in, one, in God's major project. Here, his kingdom project. Look at verse 7. So then neither the one who plants, that'd be Paul, or the one who waters, that'd be Apollos, is anything. But God causes the growth. That's where the glory is. Why would you boast about men? Why would we say this person or that person matters when in fact it's only God that causes these things? If God doesn't reach out to us, if God, if we don't respond to the call of God, guess what? It's all about God. It's got nothing to do with the preacher. It's got nothing to do with who he is or who she is. It's always possible. It's, it's one and the same. Notice verse 8. They're going to say, we're one and the same. We're all doing the same. It, it, we're all involved in the same work. Now he who plants and he who waters is one. But each will receive his award according to his own labor. Now, here's the differentiation. So we're all one. We're all working on the same project. It's all God's farm. We're all serving. But the way I serve has nothing to do with how someone else serves. I, I don't mean that because, I mean, totally, because obviously if Paul doesn't serve correctly, it's going to be harder for the next guy necessarily. But he says, listen, I, I serve and I'm responsible for my area of ministry. And what someone else does, I'm not responsible for. In other words, I can't control that. I'm gifted in a particular area. I have opportunities in a particular area. I can't be all over the place. I can't do everything. So I do what God's called me to do. I do what God's gifted me to do. I do it to the best of my ability. And here's where he's going. I'm going to be judged based upon that. I'm either going to be rewarded for a good job that I did or not rewarded based upon the same job. <coughs> Excuse me. Something bothered me here. Not rewarded. The faithful worker, it's always possible that one would plant well and the next person wouldn't water so well, but the faithful worker is not penalized for the faithless one. Does that make sense? He says, listen, it's, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, we're all one and the same. At the same time, we're not. Paulus has his responsibilities. He's got his time. He's got his opportunities that God has given to him. He's responsible for those things. I'm not responsible for that. I have mine. I have my giftedness. I have my responsibilities. I have my job within the body of Christ. I have that time limit. And Paulus is not responsible for me either. So yeah, we're one at the same time. No, we're also separate. And the faithful worker is not penalized for the less faithful. Each one is rewarded for their own individual performance. And so we have this whole issue, this whole doctrine of rewards, which is Spoken of quite often in the New Testament, very rarely preached in churches because we're afraid somehow that they're going to com confuse salvation and the issue of reward. Salvation is completely free. We, we've seen that. Here's uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace, grace, that's free gift. You have been saved through faith that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not a works. There's not a thing you did, not a thing you said, not a church you attended, not a prayer you prayed, not a deed you did or accomplished that got salvation for you. It was all upon Jesus. It's the finished works of Jesus. It is a work salvation. Jesus worked for it, not you. It's his works. It's us trusting his works. We've been saved by the grace that comes from Jesus' works. That not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We have no way to say, hey, I deserve to be in heaven. No one will ever say that. Everybody will be there upon the grace of God. We'll all be, all be there on the same level, in that sense, on the same merit. So, so on the one hand, we have the, the salvation of God, which is completely free. And then on the other hand, we have rewards, which are not free. They are earned or not, depending on what we do. That's what Paul's speaking of, and, and we need to differentiate between the two. We're not talking about salvation. Salvation's not in question. Rewards are in question. Paul and Apollos, here's an example. The example that's being used. Paul and Apollos are both Christians. They're both servants of God. Now, if Paul serves faithfully, he's going to be rewarded, and if Apollos doesn't, he won't be rewarded. They're both Christians, both servants. Both have respons different responsibilities. They're going to be rewarded based upon the responsibility that God calls, has called for each one of them, but it's going to be equal and even in the sense that some, they'll be rewarded for, for their faithfulness. Uh, so, so 
So salvation is free, as we see here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But notice, rewards are not. They're, they're, they're based upon our works. For the Son of Man, again, heaven's not in question. But, but how we'll be compensated in heaven will be in question. For the Son of Man will come in his glory, the glory of his Father with his angels. First of all, do you believe that? Jesus has not meant some words here. Do you believe that the Son of Man, Jesus, will come in the glory of his Father with his angels? Come from where? From heaven to earth. From somewhere to somewhere else. Jesus is talking about coming here. And then he will reward each according to his works. Do you believe him? Do you believe him? I would suggest that you should, not just because he says it here. Well, actually because he says it here. But just to make sure that we understand this is a serious business, he doubles down on it. There is Revelation 22. It says the same thing. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Do you believe him? Then it ought to change the way you work. It ought to change your, both your attitude and your actions. You're going to be lackadaisical. Listen, you are setting in stone what eternity is going to be for you. You're setting in stone, number one, by what you believe. What you believe determines where you go. So if I believe in Jesus, I go to heaven. If I don't believe in Jesus, I will go to hell. So that is set in stone. And then number two, by the way that I serve Jesus, I'm setting in stone what my rewards, eternal rewards are going to be. And Jesus guarantees this. It's all the way through Scripture. It, it, again, it, heaven's not in question anymore because that's determined by what I believe. But my rewards are in question based upon how I serve. And so Paul is now moving into that uh, teaching here in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. So our sins have been paid for. That's accomplished by Jesus. But our rewards are at stake. And as we do that work faithfully, we reward it. Or if we don't. So at stake is these rewards, this pay, this compensation that God has for us. It is uh, God's project. We're involved in God's project. So, so he uses the metaphor of farming, first of all. So we're all laborers in that farm field. Like I said, we're all plants in the farm. But we're also laborers. And so how we labor is going to be determining our salary, if you will. Again, heaven's not the question here. It, it's an eternal compensation. Now, what exactly is that going to be? I'm not exactly sure. But it's going to matter. How do we know it's going to matter? Paul speaks of it. Jesus speaks of it. Peter speaks of it. John speaks of it. I mean, the writers of the New Testament all speak of it, how important it is. It's going to matter. You're going to stand before one day, you're going to hear the, either words, well done, good and faithful servant, or you didn't do too well. And by the way, whatever that is, it's going to be permanent for you. It's going to be permanent for me. So, so eternity, I have, I have a chance now to change that. So I haven't been doing too well up to this point, okay? Start doing well. Repent. Change your direction. Start serving. So God has saved you so that you could be useful in the kingdom of God, in the field of God, but you hadn't been laboring very hard or you hadn't been doing anything at all. All right? Stop, stop that. Start working. So see, he's been using the metaphor up until this point of a farm. Now he's going to shift from the metaphor of agriculture to the metaphor of architecture. Watch what he does here in verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. And then notice the change. God's building. So you're not just a field. We're also building. And these metaphors just help us understand what our responsibilities are and what, what's really going on here. Just, just speaking metaphorically so we can get a concept of what the spiritual work we're doing. According, notice verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation. How, why? Because that's, that's his gifting. Paul's talents, Paul's gifts, Paul's call from God is to start churches. So he goes in and he lays the foundation. He's there for a year. He's there for a year and a half. Uh, he, he witnesses. He, he organizes. He sets up elders and pastors. And then when the church gets established, he moves on. Someone else comes in and starts building upon the foundation. Makes sense? that Paul has laid. I was a wise master builder, have laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each one be careful how he builds. So, so just because I lay a great foundation doesn't guarantee that the building's going to go well. It's up to the next guy. So the next guy doesn't do his be the best job. 
Well, first of all, it doesn't change Paul's work. Paul laid a great foundation. And, and Paul's not going to lose his reward based upon the next person. But, but so, so even though Paul did great, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that I do great. And again, we have a tendency, and I've said this on church on Sunday mornings, that we, when we were part of a good church, we have a good church that are ministering to kids, ministering to youth, ministering to adults. We're reaching out. We baptized a bunch of people this past Sunday. That's all great stuff. But what part are you playing in that? Just coming, just, just having your name on the rolls doesn't make any of that count for you. Are you a worker in the field? Oh, I'm a part of a great project. Look at the field. Look at the harvest. Look at all this coming in. Yeah, but what part did you play in that? I'm a part of this great building project, the spiritual building project of God. Look how beautiful, how, look how organized, look how awesome it is. Yeah, yeah, but did you lay any bricks? Did you pound any nails? See, see, it's those questions that you need to know. You're going to be answering those questions, by the way, in a day, coming a day. Better to know they're coming now, isn't it? Wouldn't you want to know the test before it comes? Yep, me too. Me too. So Paul switches metaphors from agriculture to architecture. And just as we had duties in God's farming projects, also we have duties in God's building crew. So, so we have our own assignments, as, as we see here in verse 10. And uh, based upon God's gifting and call, look at verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than one which can believe. You can't back up and undo what Paul did. They've come to Christ. But you can mess it up from here on. We can just not do our work and not serve and maybe not necessarily doing bad things but we're not doing anything that lasts and that's kind of where he's headed here what, what's going to be last what what matters is going to be tested as we're going to see here by none other than jesus himself now if any man builds upon the foundation in other words paul says that i laid with gold silver precious stones there's three things wood hay stubble there's or st straw there's three things those are very different things aren't they so gold, silver, stones, these are pricely things. These are costly, uh, valuable, enduring things as opposed to wood, hay, straw. See the difference? One's expensive. One takes a lot longer. The other is, doesn't take near as long. It's not near as expensive. But by the way, is visible much earlier. Our tendency is to be attracted to the stuff that shows as opposed to the stuff that's of value. But Jesus is saying, listen, or Paul is saying, Jesus can see through this stuff. He wants to see what this stuff is. This stuff is flammable. In fact, it's going to be burned, it says. It's just going to go away. Poof, it goes. It oxidizes. It ceases to exist. Whereas silver and gold and precious stones, they don't oxidize. In fact, they get better with fire. If anything, they get better. And they're going to be lasting. So I've got 99% of the building made out of wood, hay, and straw, and 1% of the building made out of gold, silver, and precious stones. After the fire, what do I have left? Just this stuff. Just the 1%. That's all. That's all that's going to matter. There's only two kinds of building materials. One's good and one's bad. One's flammable. One is fireproof. Paul's saying we need to be very careful just doing stuff just doing stuff for the wrong reasons just doing stuff but it's not necessarily what god has led us to listen is not so we're, so we're doing good things the churches are serving all right but are they actually doing what god's called them to do are they only doing what's convenient only doing what, what they're able to do we should be doing lots of things there should be multifaceted ways that we minister i shouldn't just be serving in a physical sense i should also be giving but sometimes to replace my serving because i don't have time or i don't want to or i don't want to dirty my hands i just give I, I now it doesn't mean i shouldn't give but is that all god's called me to do i don't think so i don't think so so the part that i'm supposed to be giving yes that's great but the part that i should have been serving guess what that's gonna burn up that's not what god's called me to do there's a principle here. It's not only in the quality, it's also in visibility. Like I said, precious metals and stones, they're not visible, not near as visible as a haystack or a pile of wood. First of all, there's, you know, in value, but, but secondly, also uh, in, in the sense of what, what's seemingly accomplished. I mean, how long does it take to stack a pile of hay? Minutes. By the way, how, how visible is that? 
you can see it from a long ways. Wow, look at what she's doing. Isn't that awesome? Well, just because it's visible doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean that's what God's called her to do. We, we tend to major on the numbers, the number of people, the amount of money in the offering plate, the size of the buildings. And I'm not saying these things aren't bad, and there are measures of things, but if this is all that matters, then it's stuff that's going to, those numbers just burn up. If, if there's not actual, listen, repentance, uh, life change, people getting saved, people walking out into the world as disciples, followers of Jesus. That's why Jesus said, he doesn't send us to make decisions. He sends us to make disciples, followers of Jesus, sacrificial living, laying my life down every single day so that God can, can, can work through me. Again, it's easy to stack hay. It's hard. It takes a lot longer to stack gold, Silver, precious stones. But these are the things that last. We need to major in the things that last. Major in those things. In fact, anything that we do needs to be focused on. What, how, what's the eternal, eternal's perspective? So, in, so we have food pantries. So instead of just giving out food for the sake of giving out food, we're, we're using it as a, as a platform to give away the gospel. As a platform to invite someone to church where their lives can, where they can, where they can hear the truth, where their lives can be changed. As a, as a platform to say, listen, Jesus loves you. Wouldn't you like to know more about Jesus? As opposed to just doing that. Uh, marital counseling, uh, financial counseling, you know, those are all great things, but, but they're eventually going to die and not be married anymore. Die and leave all their money. So, so ultimately, we need to be giving away something else. So they become platforms. They become a, a, a point of... Of, of contact, if you will, where, where the person can, can come to realize, yeah, I have marital problems, but my real problem is a spiritual issue. I need Jesus. I, I, I lack food, and I lack finance, financial issues, but, but ultimately those are physical issues that, that point to a spiritual issue. I need Jesus. Gold and silver and precious stones, things that last, those are the things that we have to be focus on our tendency is to work for the things that please our eyes and show up good on paper and um you know although our eyes can't see through those things i know a set of eyes that can that would be jesus again let's look at verse uh, verse 12 for now if any man builds upon the foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay straw each man's work will become evident that is when the rewards come for the day will show it, that day of rewards, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So, so no, I, I can't tell what you're doing, whether that's really what God tells you to do, and you can't really tell what I'm doing, whether that really God would tell you to do, but there is coming a day in which the eyes of God himself are going to reveal all that. And if any man's work which he has built upon it remains, it shall be re, he shall receive reward. And if any man's work is burned... He shall suffer loss. So the Bible teaches clearly that some of us will pass into eternity losing some stuff, particular rewards. Heaven's not in question. Rewards are, am I doing what I can do, all that I can do, what God has called me to do for his kingdom? But he himself, it says, will be saved, so as through fire. So again, salvation's not in question. Rewards are in question. Am I doing what God's called me to do with the energy that God's called me to do, with the opportunities of how long life's going to last? How long am I going to have this money? How long am I going to have these opportunities? So am I taking this time, this money, this energy, this abilities that God has given me and using it for an eternal reward, or am I just simply wasting it on this life, making no difference for eternity whatsoever? Again, the fire's going to determine that. Not the fires of hell, but it is the fires of judgment. Some will receive a reward, others will make it through. As someone, old preacher said one time, smelling like smoke. Because the stuff that they did with their life. So Jesus saved you so you could just do nothing? No. Jesus saved you so you could tell no one? No. Jesus left you here so you couldn't, but you had no responsibility to make any kind of eternal difference in anyone else? No. No. 
So let this lesson sink in. There's a field out there. There's a building to be built. We all have got our jobs. I'm not responsible for yours. You're not responsible for mine. But I will say our work hurts or, hand, or, or hinders or helps or hinders each other. So I do my job, but you don't do yours. Guess what? It's just going to be part of a building there. You do your job and I don't do mine. Well, there's going to be stuff missing. So we got all the walls up, but we got no windows. Well, I mean, I guess the rain doesn't fall directly on our heads, but the wind sure passes through, doesn't it? See, we all have a part to play. What is your part? If you don't know the answer to that question, you need to ask God. He will show you. What part do I play, God? What place do I have in your kingdom building project, in your kingdom farming project? So I'm a worker there. I'm a crew member. I have a job to accomplish, and I only have this life to get it done. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we uh, pray together, as we let God's message sink into our hearts. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for speaking to us. I thank you, God, that you called us to this building project. I thank you, all, first of all, for the, for the workers and the builders and the servants who reached us. They, they cared enough about your kingdom. They submitted enough to your lordship that they brought us the message of truth so that we could know the truth about Jesus. And they not, didn't just stop there. They cared enough about your kingdom. They cared enough about your call and submitted enough to your lordship that, that we were disciples. We were grown. Lord, I think of so many people in my life who were so faithful to preach to me, to teach me, to live a life of discipleship in front of me. They encouraged me and drew me into the same kind of life. Or there, there are so many that we, were, that we owe so much to because they worked, they worked well in the field and the building project of God. And now, now it's come to us. The baton's been passed. And Lord, we have such great responsibility. We have uh, a generation uh, to raise up. We have a building to build, a farm to tend, plants uh, to water and to fertilize trusting you for the growth. Help us to feel the need for that responsibility, God, and the time, the short time that we have to do it. Thank you so much for speaking to us. We ask you to continue to do that, Lord, as we study your word here in 1 Corinthians. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.